everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for another fantastic webinar. This is Richard Harris over at Sales Hacker. Um, very excited to be discussing this topic today. Um, how to connect your sales process to the buyer's journey. It's actually something I talk about on a regular basis. So I'm excited to hear a different perspective than the one I pontificate all the time. Uh, hopefully it'll be a lot of alignment and I'm not wrong on many things. Uh, before we do things, uh, jump into the webinar, I want to just let people know uh, how we sort of run this if it's your first webinar. There is a chat feature over on the right hand side. Please feel free to go in and post your name, size of your company, name your company if you want to you know, promote yourself a little bit. I'm not opposed to it. Um, and if you have questions, please put them in the chat feature. Uh, we request that they go in the chat feature not just because, um, uh, rather than the question side, simply because it lets everybody in the audience see the question and other people may have a different opinion or people can connect offline after this webinar. So we really want to make these uh, fun, interesting, entertaining, and, and certainly uh, business social. So uh, we will be taking questions throughout the webinar, so don't feel like you need to wait till the end. And with all that out of the way, I would love to introduce our uh, speaker today, who is Haley Katzman. Haley is the Director of Account Development over at HighSpot. She built out the account development team, and prior to that, she also carried a bag, so she's actually been in a closing role, which I think is huge and very, very important um, for a lot of notable companies. I'm not going to go through the list, but it's very good. <laughs> you can find her on LinkedIn. Um, her team over at HighSpot um, developed an account-based approach to their sales development efforts, and one of the first things she did was she began to build out her team was to sit down and ensure a very strong alignment between the buyer's journey and the sales process. And if you're starting ABM or starting to think about ABM, it's all encompassing. It is not just a marketing thing. It is not just a sales thing. It is not just a customer success thing or an account development thing. It is an everything. So having these tight alignments are really awesome. So I know that's one of the reasons she's been so successful over there, aside from just her uh, charm and wit. So uh, <laughs> Haley, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Really happy to be here and talk a little bit about how we've um, been able to align our process to the buyer's journey and how we can help others do the same. Great. So um, with that being said, why don't we sort of jump in to um, you know, your, your presentation a little bit and then we'll go from there. And I know I've got a couple of questions for you, but we'll, we'll see where it starts to take us. Yeah, absolutely. Well, just to give a little bit of background um, on Highspot for those who might not be familiar with uh, the company. Um, we are a sales enablement platform that really helps connect the sales process to the buyer's journey, um, really focused around managing content. So, you know, one of the things that I've really focused on with my team is how do we build out those buyer personas? How do we build out the right content to use at the right time based on um, that sales process being aligned to the buyer's journey and really focusing on that consultative sales process? And so, um, you know, luckily that's um, what our platform actually helped us do internally. So I'm um, happy to share um, some insights and thoughts there. But um, we can go ahead and get started and talk about a little bit about kind of what we've seen out in the market with a lot of the companies that we've worked with where they are in the process of transitioning to having that aligned sales process with the buyer's journey. And what we've seen is that a lot of companies have a really tough time figuring out how to ensure that the sales team is leveraging the right content based on the intent in which it was created, right? So, you know, earlier stage might be more thought leadership, maybe some of the white papers, whereas later stages might be some more of the tools type content. But how do we get the sales team aligned with marketing to have that process be more focused on the buyer and rather on rather than the sales process. Yeah, and I think that you know there's definitely a push pull nature to this, right? Um, as you're looking at at the sales process, mm -hmm. you know, where do you start as you start to just think about that part of it? Like, just let's hone in at the beginning, maybe. Um, any sort of tips or recommendations there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that um, one of the best places to start. Um, and really important for multiple different parties, sales reps, sales managers, and marketing, is really to start at having a very clear and well-defined buyer persona. Because if you think about that, if you don't know exactly who your 
buyer is, what motivates them, what um, their needs are, then you know the whole rest of the sales process and even aligning you know it to their journey becomes irrelevant if you don't really know exactly who you are talking to and really understand how you can help them solve challenges that they're facing. Yeah, I say this all the time: is that you know uh, nobody's going to ever care about who you are. They're going to want to know what problems of theirs you can solve. So if you can't mm -hmm. figure out how to talk about their problems first, um, then then you're going to have a hard time breaking through. Right? There's already enough noise out there for you to compete against. So you've got to make sure your message is really, really strong. Um, as you guys look at, you know, you guys might be at a slightly different stage, so I'd, I'd be curious yeah. how you did this. And this is not one of our prepared questions, so Haley, roll with me. Um, <laughs> you know, it's very different. It's very different when you're, hey, I'm building this team versus maybe where you are now in the sales process to, sure. um, well, here's what high spots doing now. So just for the people who are at the earlier stage, right? Let's, can you just give a couple of tips aside from the ICP, the ideal customer profile? What other kinds of things should they be looking for to align the process in their ICP early on when you're building your team? Yeah, I mean that's a great question. I think that if you're early on and building out that process, I think it's you know, like we were saying, it's really important to build out that ideal customer profile. It's important to understand, you know, what things matter to them, what objections you might encounter with them. But then it's also important to take a step back. And as an example, if you're selling to, let's just say, a marketer, it's important to take a step back and look at not just the um, industry or the specific, um, let's just say, <clears throat> if you're selling, you know, a business intelligence tool not just to look at your competition and kind of how they would move through the process with that type of tool, but to look at the broader scope of what matters to them and who's going to be contacting them, what um, things are going to resonate with them, and kind of going along with the buyer personas, it's really important to understand their language. It sounds, I mean, mm -hmm. you hear that a lot, but it's really, really important, um, not just for the buyer persona, but even when you're going to engage with a specific person in a specific industry, what language are they using so that you can really resonate with them and then build that trust to be able to have the conversations that are you know further further down the sales process? I think that's a great example, and I'll, and I'll even put it into the real world terms, right? So I do train with for different sales teams, whether it's AVs or SDRs. I have to pay very close attention to what do people call their sales team? Are they ADRs, EDRs, MDR? Yep. Are they account executives, account managers? Because if I go yep. in with just a blanket um, into a sales conversation not using their language, it makes it like I'm not listening and not paying attention. And yep. it's kind of a little thing, but super important. So I'm really glad you brought that up. That's really a great, a great point. Uh, we actually have our first question from the audience. So, uh, sure. Neil, here's uh, the director of sales over at Freight Pros. So, yeah, if you send me your question, I'll, I'll give you a free plug. Um, what research goes into figuring out your buyer's journey other than what you think you know? Right? Uh, you great to question. There. Well, let's, we've got to write down what we do know, but how do we figure out what we don't know? Well, I think a really important piece here um, to understand is, especially when you're thinking about aligning both your marketing and your sales teams, if you're going to go down this path of, path of really aligning the buyer's journey um, and you're going to have this collaborative kind of you know, open communication between both of the functions, what's really important to understand is that you don't have to have everything 100% figured out before you, you know, hit the go button, right? It's a matter of taking you know, what you think might be best, and then continuing to refine that. And the best way to do that is, the obvious way is through, you know, customer conversations and to, you know, hear what's, you know, working and what's not working. But another great example is, you know, even from the content perspective, before you even get engaged with a specific buyer, what content is resonating with them? What's, you know, what's moving them forward? What's getting them engaged? One of the things from a research perspective that I really like to do with my team and is you know, hugely valuable is go out and read job descriptions of the people that you want to engage with. A job description will tell you a lot of information about what that person's qualification should be, how the company is looking to grow, 
what goals they're going to have, what even sometimes systems and tools they're going to be using. So go out and actually do the research and try and understand um, more from more than just the conversations that you're having with them. Do that additional research to try and understand um, and then continue to refine and measure rather than just putting it set in stone on day one. No, I think that's great. And, and I, I say this to everybody, it's kind of like your old eighth grade geometry class, right? Where we had to learn the Pythagorean theorem and we had to learn the difference between a hypothesis and a law. So often, particularly the way sales folks are minded, we like to be absolute in our decisions and so we define a sales process and think that's what it is. When you're early yep. stage, you can't do that yet. It's a hypothesis, and then it's your job to either prove your hypothesis or disprove it. Proving that your hypothesis was wrong is still great information so you can course correct. Right? So it's not so much about nailing my process from the get-go, it's about nailing the idea of a process and then being able to refine it. So um, I'm really I'm really glad that, that question was asked by Neil. So um, so we had a couple of questions sort of knock us off track. Let's let's circle back to, to where we are yeah. on the webinar. Yeah, I mean I think um, and this really kind of aligns with the conversation that we're having, but I think that one of the really important pieces here in kind of building out the ideal kind of aligned scenario is really just keep remembering that this is their process and not yours, right? So it's not about the seller, it's not about your sales process, it's about the buyer and about the journey that they're going through and what we'll kind of talk about here are some of the steps that you can take to really connect your sales process to the buyer's journey, keeping in mind that it's really about the buyer um, and less about you know your process. Great, no, I think that's great. So we talked a little bit about this, but um, it's really important to build out the profile of the person that you're going to be having that conversation with. So you know, um, imagine that you're meeting maybe with like a VP of marketing. As a salesperson, you might not know anything about what they do, but it's really important to learn about what problems they face. You know, what's a day in the life look like for that person? What do they care about? What motivates them? And what you know problems or challenges are they facing on a daily basis? And I think the important piece here is that if you ask questions throughout the conversation, and genuine questions, not just like you know your typical kind of discovery questions to identify you know your checklist of things, ask important questions based on what you're hearing from them, and then you're really able to build that trust and have more of that consultative sales process rather than just pushing a product or an idea. That's great. Real quick before you go into that, further into the personas, um, what about defining the company profile? How do you guys look at that? Yeah, absolutely. So defining the company profile is um, really, really important. You mentioned at the beginning of the call that we are taking um, an account-based approach to how we go to market. And so that is the, the first step in um, identifying the target accounts that we're going to be going after. So. When you think about that, the buyer personas, you know, as an example for us that we have internally are all within um, the specific, you know, either industry or company profile that we have. So it's really important um, to make sure that those buyer personas are in line with um, the different companies. So as an example, a VP of marketing at a tech company might care about very different things than a VP of marketing at a manufacturing company. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks for sharing that and let me sort of interrupt you there. Yeah, that's all right. So the main piece here to think about is the kind of journey that the buyer is going through is really an emotional and cognitive process. They're going to move from being, you know, either complacent or, you know, kind of troubled and then they're going to go through and, you know, become more clear about the different options that they might have before they're going to decide on you know, their requirements or preferences, and even before opening up the door to engage with the potential vendors. So if you think about this, this doesn't necessarily follow the typical sales path. And so you know, the question that we're you know, here to answer today is how do you align these two journeys? And so the key here is to really walk through each stage of the journey step by step and really consider those issues in tandem. So you want to start with you know, the buyer's journey and ask, what do we have to do to help the buyers move from one stage to the next? Sometimes if you think about it, the buyers are really unaware that they maybe even have a problem. 
Um, so, you know, if you're doing, you know, outbound sales, as an example, you might need to help them identify a problem and, and help them understand how you can make their life easier. Whereas if they're more aware, maybe more of an inbound scenario, they're, they've maybe already realized that they need a fix, but what you need to do is position to be able to fix their problem. Absolutely. I, I love what you have here. What are you trying to accomplish at each stage? Um, I sort of call that the exit criteria, right? To come out of yep. qualifying stage, to be defined as qualified, what's the exit criteria? Um, if you want to go ahead, go forward. We'll go yeah, absolutely. So one of the great things that, um, you know, we'll train and coach our team on is um, using other customer stories that are similar to establish that credibility. So the buyer usually wants to feel that you know about them, you know, understand what they're going through, and that you have had experience in successfully helping others in a similar scenario. So it's really important to position, you know, these these issues and how you can solve them to, um, again, as we talked about, their language and their industry and um, ensure that it's going to resonate with them. And like I said, a great way to do that is by telling relevant customer stories. Excellent. So did your slide go forward? I want to make sure I'm still on step one. Oh, it did. Let okay. me. I just want to make sure we're on the, I don't know if other people are having that or if it was just are you me. Seeing... Yep, are we seeing uh, five numbers on the slide here? Perfect, yep. great. Yeah, we're, we're good. Great. So just to kind of highlight um, this first kind of area around building buyer personas and aligning um, to the buyer's journey, really outline and understand your key buyer personas. The thing to think about is that marketing is creating content that is inherently going to be aligned to the buyer's journey. And so it's important to really align both your marketing team and your sales team. A lot of times that's done through sales enablement um, or through sales training. Mm -hmm. And really make sure that your materials are relevant and, as I mentioned, tell stories of people that you've worked with and show how you're able to help them and really focus on that consultative sales approach um, rather than, you know, being very seller-centric. No, I totally agree with that define this a little bit is I talked a bit about it, the exit criteria and you know from my perspective this is what I encourage people to think about that you have three different types of exit criteria at each stage you need to know the pain exit criteria how we articulated a pain and has the has the prospects that they have that pain or acknowledge that it's possible they're going to have that pain um, have we also articulated the persona exit criteria is the person I'm talking to at this stage of the game the right person I should be talking to to move this deal forward? And the third is the timeline. Are we converting more at least time? Yep. Yep, absolutely. Board in that ditch. So you really have to think about those three pieces for the exit criteria. And I think those questions really help you align that. Absolutely. So then if you think about kind of the second piece here is really around, um, and this kind of goes with, you know, identifying the, you know, exit strategy as well, but identify the value points that you can provide. And a piece that I kind of like to add here is identify how to handle potential objections based on each of the stages, because they're going to be very different. The value that you can provide, the objections that you're going to have to be able to handle are going to be very different based on what stage you are within the buyer's journey. Absolutely. Completely agree. Sometimes you actually have to confirm, have confirmation questions yep. <laughs> beyond, <laughs> beyond just the basic questions. Absolutely. And I think earlier in the buyer's journey, a lot of times it's about helping them realize that they do have a problem or that there is something out there that can help them, you know, either do it better or um, have an alternative, um, you know, way of doing it. So I think that um, it's not always about just talking to them. It's a lot of times about, you know, providing information, like I said, third-party research, um, and asking questions that help them come to the realization that, you know, they maybe do have a problem that they can solve. Totally agree. Totally al I'm totally aligned with you. <laughs> so if you can see here, a lot of what the kind of first part of what we've talked about is really about, you know, identifying what the stages are, 
identifying your personas, making sure that everyone um, within your organization is aligned on those, then it's about kind of going and putting it into action, right? So what materials, whether it's tools, whether it's content, training materials, what do you have to support the seller in going out and having those conversations with buyers based on the journey that they're going through? Absolutely. Where do you find some of that stuff? Do you, do you encourage your, I mean, in my, it's, it's of my opinion that oftentimes marketing should be helping us figure out that buyer journey, right? Um, but sometimes that gets lost between the marketing team and the sales team, not through any desire to be lost, but just different lenses that people see things in. Um, who should be helping you get that information through the buyer's journey, right? Yeah, well, I think that, you know, the ideal scenario is when you have a really aligned marketing and sales team. And like I said, the organizations that have a dedicated sales enablement function in place are the ones that are really able to have that tight alignment. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, when you think about some of the content that's being created, <clears throat> that that's, of course, going to come from um, the marketing team. But... In the account-based strategy, as an example that we take, a lot of the content that we use is also going to be articles that are published on LinkedIn. They're going to be um, videos. They're going to be things that the sales rep as an individual is um, coming up with and is um, using in the sales process, especially, like I said, earlier in the buyer's journey, um, because it's not... Mm -hmm. You know, in the earlier in the buyer's journey, it's not always about your product or about even your differentiators about other solutions. It's about educating and informing the buyer. And a lot of that content and a lot of that information is going to be coming from third party. And if you really want to align it to the specific person that you're talking to, it's going to, mm -hmm. you have to give the sales rep the autonomy to go out and kind of curate their own content and use that in conjunction with the content that's being created by marketing. Yeah, and so um, I guess my, my thought is, are you letting the reps do that um, on their own, or are you trying to, are you having senior reps look for that content? And, and I ask the question because in many places, not all, we have, you know, account development reps who are early in their sales career or their business career, and so we want to make sure that they truly understand what they're trying to accomplish there. How do you, how do you, um, manage around that or manage towards improving their skill set to make sure they're getting the right content? Well, I think you kind of um, hit the nail on the head towards the end. I think it's all about the training. So if you mm -hmm. have an organization that has invested in training and really driving education about the buyer personas, about the sales process, then, you know, for my team, I absolutely, they're out finding third-party resources, articles to share, and I have, you know, no doubt that they're doing that that's completely aligned to our personas and the sales process. Um, if, on the other hand, you have more of an organization where, you know, there isn't as much invested in training and you're not as aligned yet on the personas and on the buyer's journey, then in that scenario you might want to have, um, you know, either marketing or sales leadership or someone else put that together and align it to the buyer's journey for them. But I think that's kind of, you know, as you evolve as an organization and as you become more aligned both as a function and, um, you know, along the buyer's journey, then you can kind of, um, you know, let the team um, curate that content themselves. Yeah, we got a, we have a question coming from the audience uh, from uh, from Tom Belgrad. Um, and and it, this could be a definition depending on where in the funnel this is coming up, but it's uh, it may not happen in the account development stage as as much as it might others, but is it a no-no to discuss options uh, when discussing options to mention the competitor? What do you do when, you know, it's very possible your competitor could have some good content out there, right? That validates what you do, which is always good. Um, what, is your, what is your approach on that? Does it, does it occur, I guess, at your, at, at your company, does it occur at the account development level? Is that really more of a middle of the funnel kind of thing? And let me just make sure I understand correctly. Um, do you mean referencing the competitor at all or using some of the content that they have maybe put together? 
I think it's I think it refers to both. Um, they are they are two different questions. You're right, but you know we probably should look at both of them. Yeah, no, I mean, I think I have no um, kind of apprehension in talking about um, competitors and different options when in the process. I think that a key piece here is that buyers today are absolutely going to be looking at multiple different solutions or multiple different platforms, and honestly, you should yep. encourage them to do so. And so yep. one of the things that's really great when you do bring up the competitors is that when you have those conversations, you're able to create that frame of reference and you're able to mm -hmm. educate them about or steer them in a direction of other different options to look at. So I would absolutely not shy away. Um, to me, if someone yep. were selling to me and they told me that you know I was the only they were the only vendor that I should be looking at, you're not going to have as much of trust, right? You want to know that someone's yep. kind of got your best interest out there. So I would not shy away yep. from that at yep. all. Yeah, I, I I agree with you completely on, on both those pieces. Um, Oh, got some more questions coming in. Um, so this one is from uh, Janine. So what approach would you suggest we use to align the sales process with the buyer's journey when it is the sales team who is responsible for the marketing effort? Um, oh, wait a minute. When it's, it is the sales team, who is responsible for the marketing effort? I'm not sure I understand that question, Janine. You might want to re-ask that one. Um, and then we'll go to the next one from Trevor, which is, uh, what about content as it relates to brand image and long-term buyer perception of the brand that the rep individually shared without making marketing, without it being marketing approved? So what do you do when the rep starts sharing things that marketing doesn't know about, I think is the question <laughs> we're going for there. Because, um, yeah. you know, Lord knows we have that challenge. <laughs> yeah, you know, the rogue salesperson, we all know about that. <laughs> um, no, I think that that's a great question. So the way that I think about that is you can't really, first of all, you can't see what you're not tracking. And then you also mm -hmm. can't measure and optimize um, what you can't see. So I think that there's two pieces. Um, you know, in the scenario of the customers that we work with, it's really important to be able to have visibility into the content that they're using so that you, as an example, you have the initial training, teach them about the buyer persona, teach them about the buyer's journey. I mean, it's not going to be the case. It's unrealistic to, to think that every single person is going to, you know, be executing com in, a, in complete alignment. But what is necessary is for sales leadership or for marketing to have visibility into what they're doing so that you can coach and ensure that the right content, the right materials are being used. And I mean, quite frankly, that you know is leveraging technology to be able to see what they're using and see what changes they're making to content, what they're sending out, those types of things. Yeah, let me. I want to put this in a real-world scenario, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, yesterday a, a judge ruled that um, LinkedIn may have to be able to let people scrape their public data, right? Uh, LinkedIn, of course, is going to fight it, um, but it's but it's an important piece of information. So if I'm one of these customers that's selling data, that's getting things off of LinkedIn. Um, that becomes a very valuable piece of content to share with someone from an education perspective. If I've ever had, you know, all the companies who said, "Oh, we'd love to do it, but you know, we think LinkedIn's going to shut you down, or we don't think you have enough of the right data," how quickly can you turn something around um, with a team like yours to make sure they have that most recent, most valuable content in their hands quickly? I mean, with my team, it's um, it pretty instantly uh, because we use our own platform internally. I'm able to add a link of that specific article, can share it out with the team, talk to them about how to use mm -hmm. it, and we can even target that to you know Salesforce in our scenario to um, specific. Uh, let's just say it's a specific opportunity that has you know certain details. We know that you know they're using LinkedIn or related to that. Mm -hmm. um, so really quick um, turnaround in that scenario. Yeah, it'll be interesting. And on a side note, it'll just be interesting to see what happens with that. But uh, but yeah. thanks for thanks for sort of taking a real world scenario and putting it into context. So, yeah. Cool. Well, let's let's keep going. I think. Awesome. So I think that the main piece here is that um, content timing is really critical. So you don't need to necessarily wait until buyers are more than halfway through their journey before getting involved and having those conversations. You can be part of their research with content and especially with a strong social presence. So, you know, our approach, yeah. we're very, very heavily using multiple different channels, whether that's email, LinkedIn, um, Twitter, social, phone, we're even doing, you know, sending out 
um, different packages, those types of things. So um, it's not just you know what piece of content it is, but it's also about the delivery method or the channel in which you're engaging with them. Yeah, actually, I'll even give everybody a tip that I've been uh, I used it today with the team that I was coaching. Um, is that when you really want to sell value, it means you're asking for nothing in return. So when you have this great article, I, I encourage reps to tweet it out, LinkedIn it, or, or if you're going to email someone directly, put in the subject line, cool article, no reply required. And meaning, and I'll say, hey, I thought you would like this article. By the way, you don't need to reply to me, just thought you'd like the article. And that's a way to just let your prospect know that, hey, you're thinking of them, you're top of mind for them. You're not like, hey, here's an article, when can we chat again? Right? Like, right. just be altruistic, and I think that will just give you so much greater opportunity to establish that long-term relationship. Yeah, and even, I mean, LinkedIn's a great tool to use to see what articles have they published, what are they posting yes. about, what things are they liking, and then tie that back into conversation, and again, make it about them, not about you. A lot of yeah. times you can uncover a lot about the person just by reading about the things that they've posted or you know what things they're liking on social and using that is always to your advantage. Yep, absolutely, great. So we talked a little bit about this earlier, but a, a big piece of importance here is about testing and validating, right? So you can't measure what you can't see and it's always about A-B testing. Don't be afraid, I'll always encourage this, don't be afraid to A-B test because you think one's right and one's wrong. It's important to do that because you're not going to have a other way of refining and optimizing the process if you're not seeing not just what's working but also what isn't working. That's going to help you get to that clear definition and clear understanding a lot faster than just always guessing what is the right thing. Identifying what's incorrect yep. is equally as important. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, a question for you on this, right? Because the science is coming into sales a lot more than it used to, right? I think marketing's mm -hmm. always been ahead of us um, when it came to sort of this measurement and the ability to measure and track conversions and all this kind of stuff. You got a lot of data going on, right? And you know, with mm -hmm. a team like yours, you probably have a sales ops person and a sales enablement person, et cetera. That doesn't always work when you're still, you know, you're just starting your team and you got four reps or mm -hmm. six reps. You know, um, how do you manage as a manager all those different responsibilities? Do you try to delegate things out to the reps to let them take some ownership and give them some leadership opportunity and manage and measure this A-B testing? Or like, what do you do? Like, what, what's your real world answer for something like that? Yeah, yeah, great question. So what I will always kind of, my strategy and approach is that what we've learned up until this day is kind of what we use in the initial training. And so what I kind of encourage my team to do is, hey, try what we think works out to start so that you can become an expert, you can understand the process, you've seen at least how we, what the way that we think is successful. And after about, I would say, you know, two, three months of them starting out, then I say, okay, now A-B test. Right? So use what we've taught you and then try, try out your own strategy, your own approach. And then we're going to mm -hmm. monitor that um, together. You know, they're, they're monitoring their own kind of A-B test. And let's take those best practices. Let's see what's working and what's not working. And if they're seeing you know, a newer strategy, let's test that across the team and bring that back into you know, our overall strategy. No, I think that's great. And I think we've got a, a great question coming from Jason. Um, you know, particularly in today's world, the buyer's journey is now six includes six point two decision makers, right? <laughs> or heavy influencers. And in many cases you're never gonna get to the financial decider, the one who signs on it, so you're sixty or eighty percent through the actual sales process, multiple I demos remember. and all that kind of stuff. Right? So what what do you do in in the sales strategy and as you look at your sales process to make sure that you're sharing the right content with the right different stakeholders if they're engaged in the process or even if they're not engaged in the process yet, right? Because it's it's going to happen. This is where ABM really comes in. I mean, this is the definition totally. of ABM. <laughs> but in a real world scenario, what do you guys do? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's you're 100% right. This is totally what ABM is. So for us, um, what we like to look at is, um, and not to overcomplicate, but you know, first we're going to look at the 
you know, ICP. Then we're going to look at the buyer mm -hmm. personas. Then we're going to look mm -hmm. at the buyer's journey of that. And then this piece that you're talking about is what role does that buyer mm -hmm. play in the overall decision-making process? And so, right. you know, earlier in the sales process, we're looking for the internal champion, right? So when we're out there engaging with, you know, anywhere from, you know, 5, 10, 15 people within an account, we're looking for who's going to be that internal champion, who's going to get out of their seat and convince everyone else in the room that they need to go out and solve this problem, right? Then mm -hmm. when you get a little bit later in the process, you might be looking to engage with more of, you know, the executive buyer, the decision maker. They're going to have very different, um, very different questions, very different needs. You're going to have to use different mm -hmm. content with them, which is why it's really important to identify those buyer personas because, um, quite frankly, you're going to be dealing with several different buyer personas throughout the sales process, and it's important to understand throughout the sales process where you're going to be engaging with each of those different buyers. Got it. Yeah, I think that makes totally that makes total and complete sense. So, um, I think the the piece that that Jason also asked was, you know, we're trying to get to a collective yes. The challenge, mm -hmm. and I'll say this out to the team, is that you're not looking for a collective yes. You're looking for a collective that's right. Mm -hmm. Yes can mean a lot of things. Yes can mean maybe. It can yeah. mean no. It can yeah. mean yes, but not today. Um, yeah. And this is from a, a book called Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. Great I book. love that book. You guys book. haven't read it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly right. Former head of FBI hostage negotiation. Like, well, that is the definition of sales. Someone's holding my money hostage, and I need to get it. Um, <laughs> So just, again, one of those tips I like to throw out there. You're looking for that's right more than you're looking for a yes. So. Absolutely. One of the things here that um, uh, quite a few people have mentioned is that um, you really want to, especially if you're starting out and building this out for the first time, you really want to run kind of a pilot program, test this out, see what's working and what's not working. This is kind of along with the A-B test that we mentioned. And then the last piece here is really around, you want to ensure that after you have gone through mapping your sales process to the buyer's journey, that you're providing the sales team with an easy way to access those materials and to leverage them throughout the process, right? So whether that's training materials, whether that's the content that they're going to be sharing with the prospects or customers, you need to make it easy to consume and quite frankly get it right in front of them so that they can leverage it throughout the sales process and you don't have to rely on them you know, going back and having to go and find all those different items to be successful throughout that sales process which is going to waste you know, their valuable time. So one of the best ways to do this is to really, if you think about this, digitize everything, whether that's your sales playbook, whether that's the content that you're using. Your team might be one that's out in the field using mobile tablet devices. Your team might be one that you know is constantly on their computer and engaging via LinkedIn and social. You want to move away from having you know that you know hard copy playbook, and you want to move to a place where you can serve up these materials, serve up this information, and align it to the buyer's journey um, more than just kind of in the way that you train them, but also in the way that they access the material. I think we just lost the company Mead because you told people to stop buying their three ring binders. Everybody loves their <laughs> three ring binder. So. And then if you think about kind of next steps here, um, as I mentioned, for you know the team that is really looking to invest and transition to aligning their sales process to the buyer's journey, you can go through you know the first four steps that we talked about, but if you don't have that easy way to um, ensure that the sales team has access to those marketing materials and that training, then you know it's all kind of a moot point. So you really need to think about how are we going to ensure that they have everything that they need while they're in the sales process and not just during the initial onboarding and training. And so um, that's where we've seen a lot of times sales enablement technology be able to play a role in help, helping execute 
that alignment of the buyer's journey with the sales process. So, and that's great because it is all about coaching, right? It's, it's, it's training only lasts for however long the training session is. It's the coaching is where the you know rubber meets the road. Let's go back to this sort of make for the, our audience members that may not have all the training, the the technology training stuff available, right? How did mm-hmm. you do that as a manager? How did how often did you coach your team? What did you sit by them day in and day out? Like, <laughs> what did you do to give them that? that knowledge that you wanted and the support that they're seeking. Yeah, I mean, so absolutely um, conducting the trainings uh, myself, um, absolutely sitting next to them and understanding um, what they're hearing. I think one of the most important things, and this is kind of, you know, um, my uh, kind of strategy or approach is that um, even in a leader or management role, I am always doing what my team is doing. So I will be mm-hmm. you know, executing on specific accounts because mm-hmm. it's unrealistic to think that, you know, the industry or that, you know, the buyer's journey is not going to continue to evolve and you need to be tapped into that and have a deep understanding of it. So I think early yep. on it's really important to be sitting along side by side with your team and then as it continues yep. to grow and evolve, it's important that, you know, you are doing the same thing that they are and that you have a really, you know, tight relationship with the people on your team and that they feel comfortable and empowered to give that feedback so that you can optimize your strategy. I think that's great. I think I think for my generation, you know, I'm a, I'm a Gen Xer and management for us meant sitting behind a computer trying to look important and act important, right? <laughs> we weren't taught how to manage really well and I think with uh, with the way the millennials are coming onto the marketplace and there and the demand and I think it's a rightful demand and it's a rightful ask to say hey you need to coach me boss uh, which mm-hmm. you know that's not what I got I got the SF, STFU of get back on the phone right, right. Um, <laughs> so it, it's it's great to do that and I've encouraged people and I've had to do this when I was managing people is I literally have to shut my laptop down and I have to leave my phone away. It's like when I'm with my kids, I, I literally leave my phone in the other room so that I will get distracted, right? And and you've got to be able to spend time with your team. And nothing will create more loyalty and value and desire and commitment than a manager sitting with their team and just coaching them and talking to them and being in the trenches with them. There's nothing else that does better than that. You know, you can have all the enablement tools in the world, but that human-human interaction is still super key, in my opinion. So I'm glad to hear you were saying that's what, how you did it. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. So um, I do want to interrupt with another question from the audience. Um, oh, perfect. Live Q&A. Yeah. Uh, and, then we're, and then we're going to take a little bit of a detour um, that I think people are going to find very interesting. So hang on. Um, but this is this comes back from Janine. She sort of re-asked this question, um, and I think it's going to make a little bit more sense. She's trying to understand um, how to align the sales and customer process when your target market is across all verticals and requires buy-in from infrastructure, architecture, and operations. And it's the sales team that's responsible for marketing. That is a very big question to ask um, and could probably be its own webinar, <laughs> in yeah. my opinion. So I could certainly give some feedback to that too. But, you know, again, where do you start when you've got that, when you've got such a big world right now? Um, and it feels a little greenfield, as Janine described it. You know, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's definitely the case where, you know, for me, what my initial approach would be, like I said um, kind of earlier, is especially if the salesperson is the one kind of creating the content or the messaging or, you know, everything that's going to be going out to these people is really start with doing a lot of research and not necessarily, um, you know, uh, research about publications, that sort of thing, but look and see where have you found success as an organization, who have you had success with, and try and replicate that process and do the research on those types of people. So, you know, if you have multiple, if you're selling across multiple different verticals, multiple different industries, go through and create almost, um, you know, what we'll do here is create almost a content map and then try and identify who the buyers are for those scenarios and like I said, read LinkedIn profiles, read job descriptions, um, see if you can have conversations with buyers where you've 
previously had success, your existing customers, so that you can really begin to understand and genuinely understand how you can help them solve problems that they have rather than trying to, you know, come up with something new and invent something. Just really, you know, how can you help the person? Yeah, and I think, Janine, the, the other things I would put onto that are that if you're going across multiple verticals with multiple decision makers, you choose one vertical. You can mm -hmm. only focus on one vertical at a time to become an expert at it. Right, that's how you become an expert at anything. And granted, it's startup world, and everybody's like, "Hurry up, get there! You know, go faster, go better, go cheaper, or whatever." You focus on one, and it's the best advice I ever got from a VC when I was with Mashery. Was they said, "Look, if you're going to do the travel vertical, own it. Go talk to everybody, interview everybody, talk to every, you know, sell to all these right. people, figure it out. And in time, another vertical will either present itself." Or it will, uh, or you will then be able to figure out how to bridge to the next vertical, because if you try to go into too many verticals, you're not going to have enough of the case studies, right? Mm -hmm. And case studies matter. And this is this is the example I give everybody. It's like Coke versus Pepsi. If Coca-Cola is my client, right, and I finally get a meeting with Pepsi, and Pepsi says, "Hey, great, you know, yeah, just before we get started, who do you work with in my in in, in the food and beverage industry, right?" And because they want to know if I know their pains, right? And I'll go, oh, mm -hmm. hey, that's great, Pepsi. You know what? Coca-Cola is one of our customers, and they're gonna, you know, the first thing out of their mouth is probably gonna be like, yeah, but we're nothing like Coca-Cola. When in fact, they're the exact same thing, right? But that you need that sort of validation within the vertical, even though you need to specialize each sales journey to feel customized, not specialized, but customize it to that particular person in that particular company. So. Um, We've got one more question coming from the audience. I think it's a really great one, um, which is how do you help a how do you how do you help a client with multiple decision influencers reach that consensus decision, right? Um, what's best for the company versus letting the personal the personal preferences or agenda become dominant? Um, and that's that's by Mark Holmes. So Mark, thanks for asking that question, right? How do you in this you know six point two person decision making process? How do you create alignment? I think you alluded to it earlier, but I'll, I'll let you speak to it. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's um, two kind of things that I, that I would think about here. Um, I think that it's absolutely okay to help guide the team and give suggestions and advice, especially if you have built that trust with them. One of the best ways that you can um, help align the team internally is by talking about successful customer stories. So. Um, as an example, you know, you're working with a new company, telling them a story about a similar company or a similar customer and how they went through that process and the decisions that they decided um, to come to, that kind of helps um, take it away from, well, I think this and I think this and I think this, and you're kind of seeing yeah. that now the group can see, oh, well, this is what this company did and it was successful for them. I think that's a really yep. great way to help align them internally. Yeah, I think I think go read the section on labeling by in that book that we mentioned earlier. One thing, Mark, that I would also encourage you to think if you're if you're deep if you think you're deep into the sales cycle and you're having this challenge, it could be you don't have a champion. You've got a cheerleader. You've right, got yeah. somebody who really likes you, um, but they still want to stay in the friend zone, right? They're not willing to go to bat and introduce you to their parents, right? Mm -hmm. um, so. That, that could be what's happening. So you may have to have a, a very respectful conversation to say, gosh, I know you're really excited, but we're not going forward. You know, is there something I don't understand about why we can't ask these two questions from the team? And then you'll find out if your person is really a champion or a cheerleader. So. And I think, too, with, you know, finding that internal champion, a lot of times it's about enabling them to go and have the conversations internally. So, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of times what happens is you're not actually then selling to the internal champion once you've identified that person. You're mm -hmm. helping them go and sell internally to their organization. So the resources and content and everything that you might need to provide them are going to be very different mm -hmm. than if you are, you know, trying to sell to that individual, whereas if you're trying to help enable them, it might be very different. Yeah. All right. Well, I want to shift gears on us a little bit. Um, I've always been fascinated by this, and, and I know it's in the it's in the public mind these days um, about leadership and culture and things like that. And and you know, um, 
you know, obviously you're a woman, you're a very successful woman in sales, building, building on your career and your brand. Um, there's differences there. How are you building your team? Like I'm, I'm curious is because I'm a guy and you know, look, I can talk sports analogies till the cows come home. Right. But <laughs> that's not necessarily, that's a lot of bro code. Right. So I'd love to just hear, how do you build team influence? How do you, um, manage people and, and just what kind of tips do you have as just a sales leader and you know the fact that you are a woman I think will just sort of come through because um, I want to celebrate those differences not call them out to say one's right or wrong. Yeah I mean um, I have been really fortunate enough to be able to as you mentioned build out the team of people that um, I have here at High Spot and have been able to you know hire a really high level of talent really great group of people. Um, mm -hmm primarily um, composing, you know, both male and female. And I think that one of the advantages in doing that is that you really get um, unique perspectives, different perspectives. Mm -hmm. And for us, you know, kind of my leadership style has really been around collaboration and around mm -hmm. um, transparency and around, you know, bringing ideas to the table and then learning from each other. And I think because mm -hmm. of that, um, we're able to attract a really high level of talent. And as you mentioned, uh -huh. um, you know, the generation now um, with the sales process really evolving, you know, there's a demand for that type of culture, that type of environment. Yep. And I think that, um, you know, being in a leadership role and, um, you know, really promoting that type of culture uh -huh. is, uh, is really important and, you know, showing other women that they can be successful and they can be ambitious and they can, you know, um, take, you know, seat at the leadership table. I think that, you know, that's all part of, you know, where we're going um, as an organization mm -hmm. and, you know, as, as an industry. How big is your sales team? How big is the, I'm sorry, how big is the team you manage? The team that I manage, the account development team, is at 35 people right now. Wow. What? Are, are you and you may not be allowed to from a company perspective mm -hmm. percentage wise what what percent are, are men versus women um I think we are about thirty to forty percent women on my team that's great that's that's yeah. high compared to a lot of the account development teams and SDR teams I see I think that's tremendous and, and really really great what was what was the moment you knew you wanted to be in sales like what was your aha moment you know, were you <laughs> selling ice cream as a kid and you're like I love this like what was it? Oh man, um, I would say it's uh, been forever. I think that one of the things that's been kind of unique about um, my kind of path and role where I am today, um, having experience in both marketing and sales has been able to provide me with um, a unique kind of perspective of how um, we go and talk to the customer and how we are aligned internally as an organization. Um, I and you know, really competitive by nature, and totally you know get the thrill out of closing a deal. But for me, mm -hmm. being in a leadership role, what I really love doing is enabling and empowering other people to be right. successful right. and to find you know the specific path that they have. And specifically in an account development role, um, there is absolutely a path to go into sales, there's a path to go into marketing, and it's all about um, you know really focusing on training and enabling the team to. Um, to be successful. Yes, but that, that's not that's not the answer I want. So let me ask the question <laughs> a different way. Yeah. What if I were to ask your parents? Tell us yeah. a story about Haley that would say, "Hey, <laughs> we knew Haley was going to be a successful business person, whether it was sales or marketing." What yeah. story would they tell about you growing up? Oh man, it would probably be one when I was really little. Um, I think that it would probably be a story of when I. Um, I would say sales comes to me for um, convincing others to um, to do something. So I remember a specific time um, of having to get into Disneyland, and I think I was like two years old and needed to um, get in under a, a certain age or something like that. And my parents just sent me up there to talk to the lady at the stand, and I had a whole conversation with her, telling her why I should be let in. Um, and they were like, "Oh my gosh, we've got a, we've got <laughs> our hands full already." So I think, that, right. um, yeah, it's been since since I was little. 
that's that's the story I wanted to hear. That's that's mm-hmm. the stuff that I think people have in in their careers, and I, I love that. And, and I know you weren't prepared for those these sort of the personal questions around management yeah. and yourself, but I think yeah. it makes it a little bit more fun. Um, any tips or advice for people wanting to move into management, right? Whether whether you're male or female, right? Um, what have you learned about you've tried to grow your career that you could say, well, here's a piece of advice I wish someone had given me at some point. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, I think one big piece of advice, um, and you, you probably hear this a lot, but um, it, it really, really is true, is spend a lot of time in finding the right people and really investing yourself in ensuring that they feel supported, they feel trained, and genuinely try to understand where they're looking to go rather than just thinking about, you know, the numbers and keeping the top 10%. I think that, Mm -hmm. you know, that if you look at everyone on an individual basis rather than, you know, at a Mm -hmm. larger scale of a team and really try and understand how you can help them, I think that, Mm -hmm. you know, you're going to have a much more successful team. Um, So, Mm -hmm. I mean, don't get bogged down by the numbers. Really try and invest in, in the people that you have. Great. I've got one last question coming from the audience, um, and uh, I'm happy to ask it. It's always a little awkward because we're talking about tools. Um, so please, you know, whatever the law is that you know, don't buy based on this recommendation. We've said that we've said that. What are the tools that you're using for enablement? What What are you finding successful with your team that you've used that you like or don't like? And if you again. If you happen to have relationships with people in this industry that you can't say the names of the tools, um, I totally respect that too. <laughs> it's, a, yeah. it's a tight-knit community out here. So. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. And um, definitely gone through looking at multiple different solutions. And so a lot of it is kind of what is the best fit for your specific team and you know your mm-hmm. company. So I'm happy to kind of share mm-hmm. what we're using. Um, for uh, CRM internally, we're using Salesforce. For sales enablement, we're using HighSpot internally. Okay. And then, so, you actually, um, so yours yours becomes that enablement platform as well as all the other things. Yep, exactly. So we use HighSpot yeah, for it. content management, for our sales training, and for our enablement. So as an example, when we were talking about aligning your content to the sales process and buyer's journey. What we'll do is we can mm-hmm. actually target specific training materials and content to mm-hmm. specific characteristics of, let's just say, a lead contact account or opportunity. And then mm-hmm. the great part is when we talked about being able to track and measure what's working and what's not working, um, the Highspot platform will provide you with analytics to be able to see what's being used, what's working, what's resonating, so that as you continue to you know, refine the buyer journey and the buyer personas, you can have mm-hmm. concrete data to support that based on what the sales team is using and, and what's working. I'm going to have to look and see if Trevor works for you. That was a plant, that felt like a planted question now. Uh, what other tools do you like? What, other, what are you using for a dialer? What are you using for email automation uh, from the reps? Like what, what other kinds of things? Yeah, well, we're absolutely using LinkedIn. We're using Sales Navigator. Um, we're using a combination of Zoom info for getting direct dials, and then um, we're using a couple of other tools to get email addresses, um, one being uh, sales. Um, uh, uh, we're using uh, sales hack for uh, getting email addresses, which has been really successful for us. Um, we're also uh, using... Um, we're using a combination of multiple different workflow tools. We've tried out a bunch and we have partnerships with many of them. So like I said, I'm happy to you know, answer um, any questions on kind of which workflow tools would work best for certain scenarios or certain organizations. Um, but there, there's a lot of great tools out there. I think it's really just about finding the ones that fit you know, the specific needs of your team. And I'm, again, happy, you know, to follow up with anyone to, you know, help answer which ones might be a good fit for their organization. Great. If people do want to get in touch with you, um, what's your email address? If, uh, what, you know, what number do you want them to call? Or how can they call, how can they find you other than LinkedIn? Yeah, it's Haley, H-A-L-E-Y, at highspot.com. And I think the, that that is the, the best way, easy to remember. And as you mentioned, LinkedIn message, also a really great way to get a hold of me. Um, either, either one is perfect. 
Great. Awesome. Well, Haley, thank you so much, and, and a big thanks to HighSpot for um, for participating in our webinar with Sales Hacker. We really appreciate it. This hour flew by from my perspective, so I learned a ton. Um, I, I appreciate you letting me pontificate a few times as well. So uh, thank you so much, Haley, for joining us. Thank you to everybody who's been on the line uh, and taking this whole hour with us. Uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Great. Thank you so much.